All right, to quote the great Max Starks, all right, who once told me no self-respecting fat guy should ever be get, uh, get caught dead wearing horizontal stripes, yet here I am killing it, Arthur. How are you, my friend? Are you good? Man, always good, and trust me, you always look lovely, stripes or no stripes. <laughs> we do have OTAs. Now, think about this, my friend, because a year ago, there were no OTAs, nothing whatsoever. We didn't even have a quote barely coming out of what was happening down on the south side, yet here we got it today, and we got a number of guys. I'm going to get out there with a little bit of quotes for you, my friend. And I want to quote roulette, quote, quote roulette, let's do it, man. <laughs> All right, let's do it. All right, one of the guys that I really enjoyed was listening to was Cam Sutton. But before I talk about Cam Sutton, there used to be a, a sign hung out on the on the doors going out to a practice field. I think you know it. Mike Tomlin used to have this quote, take the field. Tell me, what does that mean to you, take the field, Arthur Motes? Absolutely. So take the field, man. It's very clear in terms of its meaning. It means to me that, man, I'm coming here and I'm going to put intentional work in. I'm going to make sure that I'm focused on this task that is at hand. And why I say intentional is because when you think of taking the field from just the layman's term of that concept, it's, oh, we're just going to stand on the football field and we're going to go practice. But that's more so going through the motions. That's more so doing the bare minimum. We talk about taking the field. It's a mentality. It's a mentality that it doesn't matter what might be going on in the workplace. It might. It doesn't matter what might be going on at home. It doesn't matter what distractions might have taken place prior to me coming outside to this practice field. Once I'm out here on this practice field, all I'm focused on is getting better, both individually and collectively as a team. And that's why I said it's intentional. But anytime I think of take the field, that's what I'm always thinking of. And that's why Coach Simon was always a big person to talk about that right at the door. I mean, you've seen it plenty of times, Wolf. As soon as you're coming out there, hey, take the field, man, take the field. Come on now, take the field. We, it, it, that's, it's timeless, but it's one of those things that's so impactful. Let me ask you, does it speak to your body language? You look oh, at for language fact, yes, there. absolutely. Because in the words of Coach Tomlin, we want willing participants. We don't want hostages. If I'm looking on the <laughs> practice field, you can tell the guys that want to be there and the guys that don't want to be there. The body language speaks volumes. And why is body language important? Because it sends off energy. Even though it's not verbal, it still sends off signals to your teammates. If you look like you don't want to be there, if you don't look like you're interested or engaged in being in this practice setting, well, if I'm a younger guy, why would I be excited about being here, right? Why should I be excited about practicing if this guy doesn't want to be here, if this guy isn't as enthused about being on this practice field? So that's why the body language element of taking the field is just as important as the mental element, because it all goes full circle. Well, one of the guys that has to elevate his game, there's a lot of attention being paid to, is Cam Sutton, who, of course, you know, you, you lose Steve Nelson. All right, we lose Mike Hilton. So they're gone. Cam Sutton's got a bigger, bigger, expanding role playing out. And here's what Cam Sutton said. Ready, ready, more than ever. That sounds to me like somebody that's ready to take the field. Yes, indeed. And I always loved Cam Sutton's mindset, even before he got the nice contract where, you know, he was able to be compensated a lot better for his pay. I mean, for his play. But even when he was a rookie, even, you know, early on in his career, before he had that established role defensively, when he was more so the question mark of can he overcome injuries or not, he always had that confidence that he could be the guy. He always had that confidence that if he was healthy and he was out there, that he could make plays. So to hear him saying that, and I like the extra ready part, because here you got the ready, and then he said ready again to put extra emphasis on it. I like that because it just once again confirms what I've seen from him and what I know from him just on a personal level, that this guy is not going to take this opportunity for granted. He is not going to become complacent just because he got a new contract either. This is a guy that is ready to cash in on this opportunity and go for an even bigger opportunity. And we both think that he is a guy that is going to be more than capable of doing just that. You know, it's interesting because that moment, you know, and you've had it to where, you know, you're the guy, you're going to be the guy. This is now you having that opportunity to be more than uh, checking in here and there for plays yeah. that you can be the one to 16 guy, the one to 16 starter. It's a difficult thing, but that moment that you know it, 
It's about grasping the moment and making the most of it. And when he goes on to say this, and this is what I love, he says, there's excitement at flying around with the guys, talking ball, talking that language again. I love what he says, talking that language again, because think about it. A year ago, there was no OTAs. You're sitting here and you're dialed in like you and I are talking to each other, but not with that personal you know, being able to fly around together, being able to talk the language of ball players again. Speak to that. Oh, no question. And when you talk about that language, man, imagine learning Japanese for the first time or hearing French for the first time. It is very much a foreign language if you aren't fluent in football. And the thing that I love about that is it goes beyond just the verbal element. You talk about being in person, the nonverbal communication that's associated with football in terms of that language, certain things that you're able to tip off to different people with your eyes, with your hands, with, okay, my stance, if my stance is this, if I'm more balanced, that's telling this guy behind me one thing. If I'm in a sprinter stance, that's telling this guy behind me a totally different thing. So that's the language that he's speaking of. And trust me, man, I miss speaking that language at times, <laughs> but not too much, but I miss it every once in a while. It's like, man, I, I like that language now, baby. That's my love language. <laughs> <laughs> exactly so. Yes. <laughs> no, and he, Cam says, you go, he goes on to say, you smell football in the air. Now, this is a guy who's really speaking. He's speaking to me, man. I know he's, <laughs> he's, he's got to be speaking to Steelers fan, you know, fans everywhere when he talks about that language of love that is football. Yeah, no question, man. It's something that, especially for the guys that are playing it at this level, it is such a great passion and such something that we just enjoy doing and that's why we're able to do it at such a high level and still be consistent and have that longevity because a guy like Cam you don't last this long in the league and overcome the things that he's had to overcome if you aren't passionate about this sport if you don't absolutely love this sport and with Cam he constantly talks about that and he constantly shows that with his preparation with his play when we see him get opportunities in the past, whether it was him coming in as a starter or him subbing in in a different personnel grouping. He always is prepared. He's pretty much taken advantage of every time his number has been called. And that just goes back to that passion and that love for the game. And when you, you know, talk about some, smelling it, this is it right here, man. You, it's, exactly. it's, it's different. It's just... You just feel that, man. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Now I'm getting all fired up because, you know, right. again, this is about the fans. This is about football coming. This is about emerging from all the COVID stuff and, and being able to concentrate on some something that you love. And that smell of football in the area is huge. But one of the things that's huge when you got something cooking up there is the fact there's a lot of naysayers and there's a lot of outside noise. And there has been for some time. And one of the things I love that Cam says is you got to know this, that if it don't matter to you it don't matter and speak to that arthur because it truly is about putting on the earmuffs so to speak and not mm -hmm. letting it bother you what outside noise is is happening man a wise man once told me you have to control the things that you can control the outside noise in the words of coach tom and his elevator music is there but we don't pay attention to that when we're in the elevator we're worried about going from point a to point b and that's what Cam Sutton is basically alluding to right there. And it's very important, especially in today's generation, when you have so many different avenues for people to get access to you through social media, the various platforms, obviously in person and et cetera. So it's important for us players, especially guys like Cam, who are going to be getting this new audition, right, to be a full time starter. It's important to block out the guys that could potentially bring doubt into your mind when people are constantly saying, is he good enough? Can he do this? Or they highlight the negativity or the, the bad things about his game as a player. Yeah, that can have a negative impact on you. So it's important to keep your mental just as strong as your physical. And by controlling what you control and blocking out the naysayers and basically saying to yourself, if it doesn't matter to me, it does not matter. If that's not how I feel, then it is not true. It's not facts. If you operate with that mindset, then, yeah, you're going to be successful in this level, man. And ultimately, Cam has been operating with that mindset. And it's clear why he's been able to be as successful as he's, as he's been thus far. You know, I love everything you're saying, except the one I got to take you to task on is the elevator music. Because you know why? Back in the early 80s, when the NFL was first working with the earpieces, being able to let the, the stuff for quarterbacks, uh -huh. put it in the, in the ear of the tackles. What they were experimenting with was finding out whether or not 
You could do this in a dome. And I'll never forget, mm. we were in Minnesota for a preseason game, I believe it was. We're in a dome, and Tunch Ilkin had the piece in his ear. He came back to the huddle, and he's banging his head. And I go, what are you doing, man? What, what are you banging your head for? And he goes, I got elevator music in my ear. <laughs> Somehow one of the one of the radio waves got mixed up and he was listening to, to elevator music yeah. in, his, in the huddle in the dome yeah. in the Minnesota. I mean it was crazy. See, and touch right there. That's why he was trying to get rid of the elevator music, man. Typically, elevator music associated when you're in the elevator. If they're showing up on the football field, I'm with you. Something is not right. Red flag, red flag. Exactly. <laughs> All right, now here's one of the great things he, uh, that Cam Sutton winds up saying, too, just to wind this old matter up here. Leadership qualities are on display every day. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, man. When you talk about leadership qualities, more so the OTA element of it, because that's the part that I always find interesting, because with OTAs, they are voluntary. And no player should be docked or viewed as – less committed to the team because they aren't here. But at the same time, the guys that are here, it does send a more significant message. It gives people, younger guys, the ability to bounce things off their heads and stuff like that. So when you talk about that leadership going on daily, that's what you're talking about. When you, when you see some of these veteran guys that are there, their ability to just lead by example sometimes. Obviously, rookies are supposed to ask a ton of questions and be a sponge and soak it up. But at the same time, some guys, they just take the approach of let me just see who the guys are that are out front. Let me look at the guy who's been a starter here, been an all pro, been a pro bowler and learn how they work that way. So without a doubt, the leadership qualities definitely are on display during this time of year. You know, you think of that when the, and, and you look to what's going on. Now. You got Big Ben who was checked in. He's doing it. And in another place, there's another famous quarterback that we don't need to concentrate on who didn't and decided not to yeah. be there. But I think to me, it speaks to the great leadership, your desire to kickstart everything in the right way, especially when you're putting in some new offensive concepts, when you got some more that the pre-snap motion shifts and all the other, uh, you know, the shiny things that are going along with the new Matt Canada offense. It's good to have a big Ben out there. It's good to see a guy like him and Cam Hayward, two guys that really represent leadership in that locker room. Yes, 100%, man. I think it's always important to have your veteran guys there. I remember when I was playing, obviously Ben would be there. We saw Troy in, in 2014, my uh, first year here, his last year, Ike Taylor, guys like that, Lawrence Timmons. And I would always say to myself, man, if these guys are showing up, these are pro bowlers, all pros, obviously Troy Hall of Famer. If they can be here for OTAs, well, what is my excuse to not be here? That's what I would say to myself, because unless I view myself as a better player, more productive, more established, whatever, if I wasn't viewing myself as better than them, I couldn't allow them to be here and quote unquote be outworking me because that's the, that's realistically what happens. Right. So when you think about that, it sets the tone. It, it, it lets people know that, hey, we take this serious. Anytime we are able to talk about chemistry, right? Because we always hear team chemistry. We always bring it up in the season. It's always important during the season. But during the off season, it doesn't seem like it's a priority. Well, you can't get team chemistry if you aren't intentional with building said chemistry. And here in Pittsburgh, the guys show up to OTAs because they understand that. Coach Tomlin historically now has taken one of the 10 practices and says, we're going to go to a, a place to bond. Dave and Busters, we're going to go both. We're going to go somewhere to just show why team chemistry is important and how it's going to help us later on. These are all the things that take place during OTAs. And when you have Ben Roethlisberger, the captain, the face of this franchise for over a decade now, two decades, when he is there, that sends the signal to everybody else within the organization that this is important and we have to all be here so we can continue on pursuing a seventh Lombardi. Beautifully put. All right, I'm going to move on to Minka Fitzpatrick because Minka had some interesting things that I thought uh, he, he kind of let just laid out there, and it really speaks to what's going on, I think, with the OTAs. For instance, the things that make you a great college player are the same things that make you a great NFL player. Problem is guys stop doing it because they get complacent. They get tired. Um, I thought that was interesting because it really does tell you something about the mindset of Minka, and it's true. 
What made you a great player in college can make you a great player in the pros, but it's about doing the fundamentals. And the fundamentals is the great Chuck Knoll used to say years ago, great players, elite players were guys that simply did the fundamentals better than anybody else. Absolutely. I've heard that as well, man. It's all about doing the ordinary things extraordinarily, right? The guys that can just be fundamentalists, that understand the basic steps and are just consistent. They do it every single time. I would always point out James Harrison's patented rip, uh, rip rush when he's rushing the quarterback, right? It wasn't as if this is so elaborate or so just high end that the average person can't do it. No, the thing was that he was so just intentional in that move. He understood the nuances of that move. And ultimately, he got it to the point where, hey, I know wherever I'm at versus whatever blocking I may face, whether it's a jump set, whether it's a vertical set, where, whatever is going on, I know how to operate my move and I know how to make this move be successful. It's fundamental, but he was just obsessed with making sure that part of his game was perfect. And that's why I showed up and was so successful for so long. What Minka is talking about is 100% true. The things that we did as collegiate players, you don't get to the NFL and you just shift and become this drastically different player. You don't hit new growth spurts. You don't go from being a 4-7 guy to a 4-3 guy. That's just not how it <laughs> operates. But the guys that are able to continue to work, continue to stay healthy, continue to stay hungry. That I mean, complacency and, and hunger, those things go hand in hand. A lot of guys, when they get here and they taste fame and they taste success, they taste money, they taste all these other outside influences, yeah, at times it becomes difficult for them to still have that edge about them, to still have that hunger, that back against the wall mentality that a lot of us typically have coming out of college. But the guys that are able to keep that feeling, the guys that are able to say every day we're going to bring our heart ahead at lunch pill, those are the guys that are able to outlast the, the league average, right, of three years. Those are the guys that are able to put together long careers that are successful and see guys play at a high level. And ultimately, those are the guys that become the fan favorites as well. So Minka is right on task with that. And obviously him mentally saying what he said lets us know that he's mentally in the right place as well. You know, it was interesting because Mick had also proffered the statement, talked about the fact that Ben was there and how good it was working against mm -hmm. Ben out in the field, even to the point where Ben had looked him off to one side and then come back to another on the backside of the play. And how that, even in this offseason, was important because it gave you that ability to go back, watch the film, watch what you did, and then see what a great all-time great, let's put it, does with the ball like that. I thought it was interesting, even at this very early stage in the offseason, he's talking about the nuances of watching the quarterback's eyes and, and what that does to coverage. Absolutely. And when it's good on good, you can do that. When it's really good on – varsity or jv right questionable we know how that goes at times it's hard to evaluate that if i'm sitting back there and i'm ink and i'm in the post and i'm saying to myself okay this quarterback should never make this throw and he does because he's just not varsity material then yeah that doesn't help me that's not helping me get better but if i'm seeing a quarterback like seven and he's giving me legitimate game looks He's giving me legitimate look offs. He's challenging me and things like that. Well, now I can grow so much more now because I can get this type of work in OTAs. I can review this in OTAs without having to wait for the season to get here. And now we're having to correct it from a game, which we really don't want to have to do. So we have for a fact, man, Ben being there, getting those type of reps against a guy like Mika and all the other starter caliber guys and just the you know top guys that are there. That's what you want. You want to have good on good because that's how you get that skill development that we're always searching for. You know, it's funny. Now, I got to ask you something because you brought it out as usually you do. You bring out some great point. You don't even know the greatness that you're bringing out when you're not even <laughs> trying to be great. But the fact is, you talked about James Harrison and the no dip, just rip. Because, of course, James mm -hmm. was so strong and so short, he didn't even have to dip and throw that uppercut. He just threw the uppercut because he was already short and underneath mm -hmm. the guy's butt. How do you compare that to an uh, Alex Highsmith who does the 
all dip and no rep because he goes down, puts plants his hand, dips under the big tall trees, and it's two ways of rushing the passer that are very unique. First, I first time I saw that all dip was uh, Cameron Wembley way back up. Mm, in the, I remember in the, Cameron Wembley, absolutely. Remember, you know, yeah. And, Cleveland and him and Marvell Smith going at mm-hmm. it, but just real quick because I had to, you brought it up, so I want to. What's your what's your viewpoint on those two? Yeah, man. Honestly, I tell people it's more than one way to skin a cat, right? And for right. Debo, the rip was largely because number one, he was already short, but number two, he wasn't as flexible as some of these more athletic rushers. So that was how he responded to that. Now, a guy like Alex Highsmith, why does the dip without the rip benefit him more? Well, he's extremely athletic and he is flexible. And that's why he's able to get low and bend the way that he does. But we know from a strength standpoint, we want him to improve in that department. And that's why the rip isn't working for him the way that it would for Debo, because Debo is what a six, seven hundred pound bench presser. You know, he 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 curls, he he curls hummers, and he, you know, he does all these inclines with helicopters. Like he's that strong. That's what he is. So not everybody can do that type of move. But when I look at Highsmith. And I think of just the flexibility that he has, the bend that he's able to possess with his ankles, knees, and hips. Debo couldn't move like that. And that's why I do feel like Highsmith is going to continue to have success with his just dip rush. But hopefully the (laughs) other part of his game will develop as well. But that's the big thing, man. Like the lack of flexibility by Debo, but just how freakishly strong he was, that was like the perfect move for him to create. And yeah, it, it worked out extremely well for him. Absolutely. That was a great summation, my friend. Now, <laughs> yeah. you know, we're going to move on because I want to talk about some quarterbacks. You know, we've got four yeah. quarterbacks on the roster, yeah. but only one of them is under contract past 2021, and that would be Mason Rudolph. Mm-hmm. Now, Mason, I'm excited. I, I know a lot of people, They and some people have the different opinions about it, mm-hmm. but you look at that Cleveland finale that he played in Cleveland when he threw for 315 yards, two TDs, yeah, he had one INT, but let me tell you something. This young cat is doing more with less than uh, I, I see in a lot of places. I like the fact that Mason Rudolph is on board for 2022. Yeah. And for me, when I think of Mason, he's very polarizing, right, among Steeler Nation. And a lot of those I don't feel like are necessarily because of him. I think it's a lot of variables that have played into it, both what he's been able to do and what he hasn't been able to do in terms of just sustaining the starting role when uh, when Ben went down. But I always tell people I challenge people to do this. Mason's an NFL quarterback. He started games in this level instead of always focusing on what he can't do make a a list of three things that he can do. And for me, the three things that jump off the screen to me that I know he can do, number one is throw the deep ball. We've seen that not just in week 17 because people will say, well, that's a small sample size. He he only had a couple of them. What he did have a good amount of those throws in week 17. We also saw that in the finale of the season before versus the Jets, right? Remember when he got hurt in that game, but he comes in, he hits, I believe it was Deontay Johnson, a couple of passes downfield. He looked good as well. He's grown so much from that first set of starts that he had when Ben went down. And when I say I love his deep ball, that's the first thing. And that's why, because I've seen the growth. Number two, actually seeing him grow and develop. You talk about a guy that's made strides. You think about Mason, those first couple of games we saw him in when he first got that start when Ben went down. We think about our perception around him then compared to that perception following the week 17 game against the Browns. He made a monumental leap in his productivity and his confidence in his play. He looked night and day. So the second thing, like I just said right there, is that development, that year two growth. We saw that. I think he can make another jump. And then the final thing is I absolutely enjoy watching his command of the offense. When you watch this guy in the huddles, when you watch how this guy talks to his teammates, he has a command. He has that natural ability to be the leader in that offense. So that's the other thing. And I feel like that's extremely important when you're talking about being a quarterback, a starting quarterback, because he said that he wants to be a starting quarterback in this league. You have to have leadership qualities. You have to have a command of the offense and the huddle. And he does bring that to the table. There's no question about it. I love it. I love the fact that, yes, he can throw the deep ball. His development, think about it. He had no preseason last year. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, nothing. I mean, uh, Mm -hmm. you've got to get reps, you know, and that's like crazy. Mm -hmm. 
And when Go he ahead. got his start, and I was just saying, when he got his starting opportunity, let's be real. That wasn't supposed to be the year that he played. He was supposed to come in and sit behind Ben, but Ben goes down six quarters into the season. Right. Now you're forced to just put him into this action. And I, I, I equated it to you having the perfect plan for this person. Everything is set up for this person. And now I have to make it work for a totally different person. That's what he was dealing with. The office was set up for Ben Roethlisberger. It wasn't set up for Mason Rudolph. So when Mason came in, it was round, you know, round peg, square hole, or however you would square peg, round holes. Can we say that right? And you could just see where it wouldn't fit. It had it had glimpses, but as a whole, you knew that it was going to not work out to the best of both of their, you know, expectations and things like that. So for me, man, I just think that with Mason, that story, it's a lot left in there. It's a lot that's, that needs to be reviewed. And I think, obviously, the Steelers will reciprocate that feeling because they extended him, right? They gave him the one year for $5 million contract to go with that as well. No question about it. And I think you summarized it perfectly. What I like is the development because you know he can throw that deep ball. Now, if you're going to throw the deep ball, you better have somebody you can throw the deep ball to. And, of yes. course, that would take us to our next and final point that we want to uh, you know kick around here today would be the great chase claypool maybe having an opportunity to go long ball more maybe is it james washington what about deontay johnson you got juju i mean this is a quartet of receivers that i think cut loose they can do some really interesting things and i gotta tell you something just the thought of big ben going yard to guys you know like the the, the young chase chasing the ball deep i love it hey for a fact this receiving group can be special. They have to be consistent, but if they're consistent, they can be special. They have the talent from top to bottom. We talked about just the depth that they have, the top end talent. They, they check a lot of those boxes out there and they're all young, which is even better. But Chase Claypool, he is the guy to me. He's the X factor in that group. Number one, he can do something that none of those other guys can in terms of his big speed that he plays with, his ability to legitimately Take the top off the defense. He is a guy that we saw even last year with Ben. You can just throw it up in his vicinity. He's going to get it. That right there is special because we've seen guys of similar build take those year two jumps. I mean, Chase led uh, in terms of rookies. He led all rookies with nine touchdowns last year. He was a very productive player, and we still felt that he was underutilized, especially towards the second half of the season. But I think about a guy like DK Metcalf, right? He had very similar numbers in year one that Chase Claypool had in year one. They're built the pretty much the same. They they test the same. Like they, they're almost identical in terms of who they are. But then you look at the jump that DK was able to make from year one to year two, where he goes from good player to star. Chase is right in line to do those same type of things. And I feel that Matt Canada is going to make him more of a focal point because he has he's earned that. He's shown more than enough potential, more than enough productivity that he needs to be more of a focal point in this offense. And I just feel like he's more than capable of handling that load. You know, I go back to when we saw him have that great game last year and he rushed for a touchdown, he caught a touchdown mm -hmm. pass, but he also went down and made the hit on the kickoff. Now, yes. I will say this, I would like to see him maybe not do the kickoff. Maybe uh, we start because I, I agree with you. I think he's yeah. the next big thing. I think he's capable of doing some really, really astronomical numbers if he's given the ability to run free and put those those safeties into conflict and get one on one with the with the D backs and so forth. So to me, it looks like I, I would like to see him be able to develop some of those veteran stuff. You watch Juju. Yeah. Juju at the top of his routes, how he gets a lean and, and he gets mm -hmm. a little bump and, and a little rubbing and stuff like that. That's the veteran stuff that creates that separation. Yes. And that, of course, is part of any guy coming along and getting that mastery step forward in the art of pass catching and route running. And I think he's he's ready to do it. Absolutely, man. And those are some of the, the, the critical things that – separate the good guys from the elite guys out there on the perimeter their ability at the catch point man to just create that little bit of separation that added space 
to make it an easier catch for them and give the quarterback a little bit more of a window. Those are the things that he's definitely going to continue to work on and hone in his game. But if he can do those things, right, because we already know he's a good player. He's already proven that. But to make that next jump, you got to focus more on the minutia, the little details associated with the position. And if he can get those things squared away, absolutely, this guy can make that type of jump. Let me ask you this, and we'll wind up on this final point. You look at a guy like you, you've talked about, the physical specimen that he's like DK Metcalf. Um, at the same time, I don't think I've seen DK Metcalf club a guy out of the out of his way uh, in running a route when he's being pressed at the line of scrimmage. I still look at Chase and go, did you really do that? Did you really club that guy out of the way? I mean, Joe Hayden spoke to his greatness last year in training camp, but the fact is his physicality could really separate him from a lot of receivers in the NFL. Oh, yeah, and he likes to block. You saw that in the Tennessee Titans game. Even though he wasn't getting targeted or even being a focal point in the passing game, he was more than willing to get it and mix it up in terms of just blocking and moving guys off the ball. He is a very physical man, and – I like the fact that he is a big physical man because typically it seems that for some reason at this level, it's always reversed, right? The bigger guys are, or they want to be more finesse. The little guys want to be the tough guys, right? But right. with Chase, you finally got it where you got an actual big guy who wants to play like a big guy and actually be just that physically imposing presence on the field. So I definitely like that. And hopefully he'll continue that, which we definitely think he will. Well, Arthur, that's a wrap. That's all I have, my friend. Thank you for joining me, and thank you, Steelers Nation. Appreciate y'all.